Welcome, everybody, to our Hope in Recovery Forum. Uh, my name is Ed Portillo. I am the uh, program manager of NAMI Orange County. We are part of NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We are the largest grassroots organization that helps families, individuals, and parents that are affected by mental illness. And uh, one of our forums that we do is uh, focused on the issues at the intersection of mental health and substance use. Uh, the, mis the mission of Hope and Recovery is for families and peers to engage with topics that are at the intersection of mental health and substance use. And the, forum, <clears throat> the forums will set around these three values, agency and individual's capacity to determine their own future, access, providing resources to encourage self-advocacy and support, giving hope to peers and family members affected by substance abuse and mental health. So we um, have been doing this since January and have had engaging guests and engaging questions. So we hope that you would can keep up the engagement um, by asking questions throughout the presentation. There will be time uh, that Shane will take to answer questions. So if you want to put that in the Q&A or into the chat, um, he, will, he, he loves uh, to get questions and we'd love to keep this as interactive as possible. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guests and pass it over to him, but uh, we're going to continue to do more of our hope and recovery forums. Uh, next month, we're going to focus on the foster system and, and children that are in the foster system uh, in October. So look for that. But in the meantime, I'm going to introduce our guest, uh, Shane Wood. So Shane K.M. Wood is an award-winning educator with a passion for helping people in need. With degrees in psychology, English, English literature, and theater, Shane looks for new and unique solutions to the challenges presented to him. With more than 10 years' experience teaching university and high school, Shane has dedicated his time to bettering the lives of young people throughout Southern California through work in basic needs and mental health. He has seen firsthand the devastation that fentanyl poisoning can cause when he lost his father and his brother. He's honored to be able to use his experience and expertise to help combat the epidemic and looks forward to the day when people are safe and educated. I want to welcome uh, Shane Wood. Hey, Shane. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. Um, I've got a presentation here to sort of talk about uh, a lot of the issues that are looking, uh, that are working around fentanyl and then um, specifically how that affects Orange County. Uh, since most of our participants are uh, directly from there. Uh, but at any time, if you have questions or you want more clarification on something, please drop those questions in there. I will be sure to take a look at them uh, so that we can get this there because each presentation is a little bit different, right? Depending on uh, what the audience is looking for, what you already know, what you maybe need more clarification on, okay? So feel free to do that, but uh, with that, I will jump on in. All right, so everybody can see that okay? We're good? So I work for an organization called fentanylsolution.org. Uh, we are a nonprofit that uh, is based in Newport, but we work all throughout Southern California, uh, as well as have partnering um, organizations that we work with across the United States trying to work on education and advocacy surrounding the fentanyl poisoning process. So um, what that means is that we do events like this. Uh, if anybody has gone to any of the opioid events around the county, you often will see us there uh, tabling. We provide uh, distribution for naloxone and fentanyl test strips. We'll talk a little bit more about those if you've not heard about them before. And then we go into boardrooms, schools, book clubs, anywhere that wants to know more about how they can protect themselves from fentanyl and be sure to keep their loved ones safe, we are willing to go and have those conversations with them. We will do naloxone trainings for individuals one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. You can come on into the office and we'll take care of that. Or, you know, we've done, I think the largest training I've done in the last month, there were 50 in the room. Uh, but I, you know, love to challenge myself. So if there's a bigger group than that, we can definitely put it all together there. But the point is to provide education and understanding about what fentanyl is and how it affects pretty much everyone 
um, has been affected in some way, whether they know it or not in the US. So that is the work that we're doing. So if we look at that, fentanylsolution.org is a Newport-based uh, nonprofit. And our team is deeply committed to making a difference and saving lives by addressing this dangerous drug's devastating impact on communities across the country. So what is illicit fentanyl? And you'll see, uh, sometimes I, I slip up and, and I also just say fentanyl um, because the base uh, is the same. But one thing, one of the first education pieces that we need to understand is that there is a dramatic difference between medical fentanyl and illicit fentanyl. And the name should give you some idea, right? Illicit, this is something that is not legal. So people, if they do know about fentanyl, often what they know about is they had a loved one or themselves that uh, underwent often cancer treatment or pain management of some kind. And there are patches uh, that are often used. Medical fentanyl is a very effective, very potent and highly regulated pain management synthetic opioid. Now, what does that mean? What is a synthetic opioid? Synthetic, right? That is created. So synthetic opioid, unlike um, if you were to look at something like heroin, I know people are like, ah, scary, but heroin is an opioid, right? That is what we uh, it's an opiate. Uh, and then we have opioids that are derivatives from that. So it actually comes from the biological product of the poppies, right? That's how we get opiates. And from those, we created opioids. So it, there is a finite amount that can be made because the base parts are organic, okay? Synthetic opioids, what happens there, every piece of that puzzle can be made in a lab, okay? So now you're not based, you're not worried about how well your crop did, right? You're not worried about uh, how to get the uh, pieces from one area to another. If everything can be manufactured in the lab, it can be made much, much less expensive and it can be made much, much quicker, okay? So a synthetic opioid uh, is lab grown, but it works the same. It attaches to the same receptors as your opiates. So your heroin, your Oxycontin, your uh, Percocets, your uh, Norcos, right? Any of those pain medications that you, uh, that you are aware of, uh, if you've seen any of the documentaries or the shows that have come out recently, uh, Dope Sick, uh, there was one on Hulu, you know, anything hydrocodone, right? Those are going to be your opiates. Fentanyl falls into the same category in that it works on those same receptors, but it can all be made in the lab. The next thing that makes fentanyl different than some of these others is that it is incredibly, incredibly strong. Again, we're able to take a lot of pieces of it. We're, we're able to break things down and make it so that it is uh, as strong as possible. So regular fentanyl, just, you know, your base parts, uh, is about 50 times stronger than heroin. And it's about 100 times stronger than morphine. Okay. So if you think about that, if you've ever had any kind of a surgery, uh, and you know, they usually put a little regulator, right, if you're gonna have morphine, because it's highly addictive, it's, uh, you know, it can be dangerous. Now imagine having something 100 times stronger than that, that's what we're kind of dealing with. Now, that still sort of counts for both your illicit and your medical fentanyl. They are all very strong. They are all lab made and they all are incredibly um, potent. Now, where the difference comes in that, and that, why we really want to make sure we understand the difference between medical and illicit is that, as I said before, Medical fentanyl is highly regulated. It's very, very difficult to get anything other than what is absolutely prescribed for and documented, right? You've got the manufacturer that sends to the hospital. Doctors have to sign it out. Pharmacist who is specializes in distribution is going to train, and then you're going to get it, right? There's a lot of 
uh, warnings that come with it. So it is highly, highly regulated and is still one of the best and most profound pain management medications that we have available to us. So definitely something, you know, we don't want to be like, ah, I can't have medical fentanyl because I'll die. That's not necessarily the case. It is because it is so potent that we have so many regulations available to us. The issue comes in when you put that word in front of it, illicit, because what happens then is that all of that um, regulation kind of gets thrown out the window. You're not worried about getting everything just right. You're not worried about distribution patterns. You are having any and everyone who is interested in sort of creating this product getting to kind of do their own thing. It's a little like the, um, you know, the American idea of the Wild West. Like it just, people take the base parts, they bring it over and they sort of, we literally have pictures of people mixing together illicit fentanyl and binders. A binder is just something literally that, if you see the pills on the screen there, binder is literally just something that holds it together. So you've got fentanyl, often acetaminophen is the other one and you just, and then you got a nice little pill press it together and you're done. But if you think about it, do you know, do me a little favor wherever you're at. Think about we've all seen a 5-gallon bucket, right? If you were to take a 5-gallon bucket and then you're just take two bags of indiscriminate chemical and you dump those into the bucket and you take basically a stick or a spoon and you start stirring it together. Now you take that bucket after you've stirred it for as long as you're going to stir it for. And you pour that into basically like a cookie sheet, right? Tiny cookie sheet, if you're thinking about for pills. And then you smash it together. How confident could you be if someone said, these have to be exactly the same or you never get to do this again? How confident could you be that you could hand over a bag of those to somebody and each of those would have the same dosage in them? Anybody? Anybody like, yes, I know. Boom, I can do it. I, I mix cookies all the time. Not seeing any hands, which tells me probably not what's going to happen. So that's where the issue comes in. The lack of regulation means that you can't ever guarantee what is going to be in any given pill. Okay. Sometimes it could be 100% fentanyl. Sometimes it could be 0%. It's just binder. Often, obviously, the way that these percentages work, it's somewhere in the middle, right? Sometimes it's a little, sometimes it's a lot. And the issue that comes with that is you're working again with something that is a hundred times stronger than morphine. So if you're getting any amount over what the amount of the dosage can be, it can be lethal. So we have lots and lots of evidence that shows that as little as two milligrams of illicit fentanyl is enough to potentially kill an adult human. Now, we use terms like potentially for a couple of different reasons, right? You can't say 100%. It depends on people's metabolism. It depends on their own uh, resistance to drugs. It depends on what their health history is. But if you think about it, it's about a grain of rice. You know, if you take a, a full pill and if somewhere in that is a grain of rice worth of fentanyl, that is enough to potentially kill you. Now, why would that be a concern for people? That's a question we get a lot of times. Well, if we know that that little of it can kill people, why use it? Okay, well, let's think about it. Um, if you've ever seen a movie, often whenever uh, we look at any kind of drug trafficking, uh, they almost they love to show heroin, they love to show cocaine. Those ones look really good on TV. And they always put them in the kilo bricks, right? We're thinking like a bread loaf worth of drug, you know, whatever it is. Cocaine Bear came out last year. If you haven't seen it, it is outrageous. But if you ever want to know what a kilo of cocaine looks like, it's a good movie to kind of get a feel for what a kilo of cocaine looks like. Don't know why you need to know that, but for now, imagine a loaf of bread. You buy a loaf of bread. That is enough uh, heroin, 
cocaine, what have you, to distribute to 10,000 people, right? Break it up, send it off, you're good to go. Now, if something is 50 times stronger than that, then it means you need that much less to be as potent. So if you are somebody who is trying to smuggle illegal uh, substances into places other than where you currently are, do you want to try to carry around a bunch of loaves of bread and try to hide them everywhere? Or do you want to find another way to put those together? So economically, it becomes very, very inexpensive in order to make the same amount of drugs with a lot less product. And unfortunately, though, again, if we look at the extremes of things, uh, people hear lots of stories about, you know, it's because people want Americans to die. And, they, you know, there are always extremes, right, that happen at the ends of it. But if you look at the majority of why things happen, the simplest answer is usually the one that kind of takes the biggest chunk out. And what happens is if you kill one person, accidentally because they have had a poisoning of fentanyl but in that because you have laced that drug into whatever they thought they were taking and now you have 10 more customers who say i don't know why but whatever i took i want more of that from an economic standpoint not looking you know we human life is is unquantifiable in its value. But if you're looking at it from an economic standpoint, you lose one customer and you gain 10, you're gonna keep doing what you're doing because right now it's still beneficial. So this is a multi-pronged issue and we completely understand that. There is mental health aspect. There is a uh, medication affordability that is an issue in this country that makes it really difficult for people to be able to get what they need. There are sociological issues. There are economic issues. There are issues with the stigmatization of medicating that we all have to look at. But one of those pieces is also we have to find a way to make this an economically unviable option for individuals anymore. So how do we do that? Well, we have to find ways to help people to learn from their mistakes. If you're taking a pill and that one pill can kill you, there's no learning from that. This isn't, you know, uh, my parents, you know, talked about their their experimentation ages, you know, when they were uh, young, teens, uh, 20s, you know, and then they, quote, grew out of it and moved on, right? That is not the world that we live in anymore. We're finding teens who it's their first time ordering anything, you know, they're maybe uh, have had uh, a couple of pills. They get a, what they think is an Adderall from a friend because they have a big test coming up and they've heard that this can help them. And they are taking one pill one time and they're dying from it. How do you learn from that? There's nothing to learn. There's no knowledge that can be gained. So we need to look at what we can do. And first of all, we have to understand the problem before we can figure out how to fix it. So the issue is that it can be transported as a pill. That's what we see a lot. And that's what we focus on for, for a lot because rainbow fentanyl, you'll hear that term is here, but it can also come in a powder or a liquid form. So it really just depends. And part of the reason that we say that is that it's not as if you can just say, well, I'll never take a pill again. And you know that you're going to be fine because it comes in different forms. You have to have more knowledge than that. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence. People say, oh, if you squish the pills together, you can tell the ones that are real, they stay together. The ones that are fake, they fall apart. These are the exact same pill presses. We know for a fact that uh, drug manufacturers who are making illicit drugs order or create the exact same pill presses that your Xanax, your Adderall, your Percocet come in, they're gonna do the same thing. And it's a binder and it's a drug. So there's no reason why it's not gonna act exactly like any other drug. Telling somebody that you can grab it and kind of push it apart is dangerous, right? That is not a way, you can't look at it, you can't smell, please don't smell it, right? You can't touch it and know if it's different. The only way you can tell is if you had chemical, uh, 
a, a chemical uh, readout of what was in there. That's the only way you would know. And then you would have to be somebody who understood what the chemical composition of Percocet is versus fentanyl. So what do we do about that? We have to find new ways to make that happen. And how do we do it? Oh, I see a chat. <laughs> Why do you not want to smell it? Great question. So fentanyl, there is a, a lot of stories out there and you're gonna see a lot of things. And I want you also to remember again, that everything is on a spectrum, right? Um, there are always exceptions. There are always examples that fall out of the norms. And we'll talk about a little bit later that there are new forms of fentanyl. Um, and I, the names get longer and longer and longer. And so trying to remember them. Um, so, but care fentanyl, uh, Aga fentanyl is another one. There are, you know, it, it's just you take it and you you pack it on. If you remember your, you know, chemistry classes, it's basically just adding another piece to the molecule, and then they add another piece to the name. Those get stronger, and the ways in which they interact with the human body, we don't always know. But what we can talk about with the base of fentanyl is that for the most part, it is ingested, it is put into the body either through the bloodstream when it's injected or through the mucous membranes. So people will often crush it up and then snort it up the nose, you know, goes up in there, and then you get everything that's gonna happen from there. Or that liquid, you know, you do an injection, goes directly into the blood, and that's how you're gonna deal. Can you take the pill as a regular pill? Yeah, and some people do, and that has its issues as well, but regular drug users often say that if you take it as a pill, fentanyl, what it does a lot of the times, if it doesn't, if it, you know, if you're fortunate enough not to have it kill you, is that it gums up everything. It kind of gives you a tummy ache and it, it causes a lot of other issues. So they find other ways to do it. So if you were to see a powder or you were to see a pill, you have no idea what's on that pill, right? It looks like a solid pill, but maybe it got pieces fell off from the other thing. And you think about how little it takes to be able to be um, fatal, you know, you smell it, you get the leftover of what's there, may not be enough to kill you, but it's not going to give you a really great day, right? So that's why we say, you know, things like that. You don't want to necessarily, it's not something people sometimes think, well, if I even touch it, I'm going to die. I think that comes again back to uh, information from medical fentanyl that sort of gets pushed over. Medical fentanyl often, again, comes in patches. So if you were to touch it, it's going to seep through the hands. That's not the same thing as holding a pill, right? The pill's not going to dissolve into your hand. But again, anywhere, mouth, nose, anywhere that things can kind of made to absorb, this chemical is going to absorb. So just don't do it, right? Don't, don't go there. So Knowledge is the is the thing that we need to uh, need to know about. So ways in which we do that, as I said at the beginning, is we have we call them our our life saving lunch and learns, where between twenty and thirty minutes we talk to you about what opioid overdose looks like, how to use naloxone, and what fentanyl test strips look like. Okay, advocacy that's often talking with our community leaders. They don't necessarily know everything either. They do a really good job of getting themselves up to speed, but they take people coming in and helping them understand the way things work in order to be able to do that, to be able to know where funding should go, to be able to know where resources should go. Coalition building, things like this. Now you can leave and you can tell other people what you have learned about. Strategic partnering, what does that mean? How do we find ways, you know, in a society, we have to find ways that are beneficial to both sides. And unfortunately, just saying this saves a lot of lives isn't always enough. You also have to say it saves a lot of lives and people are really going to like you. And that means that your business is going to grow. Right. So we find ways to make it as beneficial as possible. Community outreach and awareness campaigns. Now, today isn't necessarily uh, specifically a naloxone training, but I just want to show you really quickly. So this is what. Let's see. There we go. This is what naloxone looks like. You might have heard of the term. Let's see if I can get it to. Come on, you had it. Okay. Um, we'll go over here. 
So naloxone, you might have heard of the brand name Narcan. A lot of people, if you haven't heard of it at all, it's totally fine. That happens. But a lot of people will hear of Narcan. The reason that I use the term naloxone instead is for a couple of reasons. One, uh, naloxone is the chemical. Narcan is the brand. Now, in Orange County, that's important because the county of Orange has last month, last month, contracted with a different distributor than Narcan. It's called Cloxado, uh, which is their brand name. Exact same chemical. Both are um, naloxone based, but Cloxado is eight milligrams per dose versus Narcan's four milligrams. So if you go to a harm reduction group like ours, you'll get, if you get two with the little red button on them, that's going to be Narcan. If you get one with a orange pattern, that's Cloxado. The names don't matter except that sometimes we see people go, well, I don't want this. I want Narcan because that's the name they've heard before. So saying naloxin helps people to understand same product, exactly the same. Narcan's been around for about 30 years. Part of the reason that we're where we're at now is because uh, a lot of the copyrights ran out. And so people were able to make other brands. Um, so that's why naloxin is really important because people think that Narcan is the chemical and that's not going to be the thing. So naloxin here in the form of Narcan is an opioid reversal drug. Now, what did I say about opiates and opioids, right? We have the, the organic and we have the synthetic ones. So if you are looking at um, your Percocets, your oxycodones, your hydrocodones, your narcos, your heroines, right? Your fentanyls, your parafentanyls, your, these are all in the opioid and opiate family, okay? So this is gonna help with all of that. About 86% of drug overdoses in the US are opioid related, okay? So of all of the drug overdoses that we have reported, about 86% of them are opioid related. Now, that is important for a couple of reasons. Narcan is about the closest thing that you're gonna find in our modern world to medical magic. There are no known drug interactions that naloxin has. So it doesn't interact with grandpa's heart medication. It doesn't interact with your brother's insulin. It doesn't interact with any other drugs. It doesn't do anything if somebody were to take a methamphetamine or um, a tranquilizer. It only interacts with opioids and opiates, okay? It also has a very, very, very small, they don't even call it an allergen. They call it a hypersensitivity. It's about a 0.02% rate of hypersensitivity. And most people, if they even have any kind of a hypersensitivity to it, it's like uh, you take a little Benadryl, you might get a little itchy, but they haven't seen any catastrophic issues even with hypersensitivity. So they don't even necessarily talk about um, allergen. And it is non, uh, there is, it, it is impossible, it is non additive, is the, that's the term I'm looking for. It is impossible to overdose on naloxone. I could take, I have a crate of it here. I could take all of it. Um, I don't recommend it, but you could take all of it. And the only thing it really could do is it can dry out your nasal passages, which not fun, but you know, if you're alive, yay. So the thing is in the industry, if you will, kind of the, the, the prevailing knowledge is if in doubt, naloxone it out. If you come into a room, or if you are in a room and somebody collapses to the ground and there are certain things you can look for often for bluing of the fingers and the lips for pinpoint uh, pupils. But for a lot of people in a high stress situation, are you always going to remember all that? Maybe not. So the one thing you want to check is if somebody collapses, you put them on their back, right? So if I was here, I'd be like this. Put them on their back, 
And if you're anywhere, if you can see, I'm making kind of a fist, but I'm putting my middle finger, my middle knuckle up a little bit. See how it's raised from the others. If you take that wherever you're at and you put it right between like at your breastbone, you imagine taking that and going up and down. You press that in there. How does that feel? Is that a good feeling? Not something that's really, and if you were to like a cheese grater on somebody, if they move, ugh, stop it. Don't do that. Even if they're like Bleh, anything, they are responsive enough that that tells us that they are still getting oxygen. They are still, there's still circulation happening. So you call 911 and you continue to watch them. If they become non-responsive, if you're cheese grating them, this is what we call a sternum rub, and they don't move, grab this, stick it up the nose, and I think it looks like a triceratops. Two on the top, one on the bottom, stick it up the nose and squeeze, okay? Usually 30 to 60 seconds, you'll see them come to. Sometimes it's subtle. Sometimes it's really not subtle. Uh, if you imagine having your teeth pulled out and somebody gives you, you know, somebody gives you the, the pain medication and you get home. And then when that pain medication starts to wear off and everything is throbbing, imagine that you go from fully painless to have not had any painkillers in your system for 12 hours in a second. That's what this does to people. All of the pain that they're feeling, all of the things that happen are at once. So what I like to say is, you are the master of your own world. I feel like this is enough for me. I don't need to then also get, you know, punched in the face or pushed over. I take, I give it to them, see if they're okay. And then I step back, let them kind of do their thing. Cause they sometimes will come up and it is, it can be dramatic, but you did your job. You save them. We try to encourage anyone to go to uh, the emergency services or how they feel. If they're like, oh, I'm back. Great. I love it. Uh, I'm going to leave. Encourage them to stay. You can't force them. If it's a loved one, there's a little bit more. You can be like, hey, you need to do this. Because naloxone should be thought of like an EpiPen. It brings you back instantly. But it only lasts for 60 to 90 minutes. If you have enough of the opioid in your system, you can relapse. You can go back into overdose after an hour once this kind of moves out. Because it's like, um, if you imagine, you know, you've got a cup here. This is your opioid receptor. And then the opioid comes in and it sits there. See how nicely that fits together? Now, imagine that naloxone comes along and it's like, a cotton ball and it bounces those out of the way and it sits here. So now the opioid can't hit it, right? Because it's filled with cotton. But eventually those cotton balls dissolve. So we encourage them for many, many reasons to go to the hospital so they can be monitored, so they can have their pain taken care of. A lot of, but you did your job, which is this. So in doubt, the locks in it out. Always call 911. Always make sure that you are good to go. Uh, and then, um, if for some reason, uh, they are not responsive to this, you've got 911 on the phone and you can say, I've given them naloxone. They did not respond to it. And that gives emergency services more information on what to do next. Okay. So, um, that's, I know that this is, this is a quick, you know, we're, we're rushing, running through things. So I am happy to, um, reiterate i'm also happy to encourage people again to take that naloxone training because we go a little bit more but really at the end of the day that's really all you need to know if somebody is unresponsive and you know that 86 percent of the time that is going to be opioids and overdoses are the number one killer of, of the u.s in the u.s this gives you a lot of reason to know this is a good place to start now if that wasn't which for some people it's not, and that's fine. Why should we care in Orange County in particular, right? We live in a very affluent, very well-funded, very um, resource-rich county. So why should we care about this? People have an idea of what um, drug-seeking behavior might look like. However, that's where this comes in. 
In 2022, <clears throat> there were 668 confirmed fentanyl poisonings in Orange County alone. Now, that says confirmed because as of this presentation, we still have 27 autopsies that are waiting to be certified. Everyone agrees, probably going to come back as fentanyl poisoning as well. But until they're certified, we don't know for sure. But if you think about it, that means we're looking at almost 700 people in one year that died specifically because of fentanyl poisoning. Because as I said, 86% of those um, of all drug overdoses are because of opioids, okay? Of those, 76% of all opioid overdoses are fentanyl poisonings. So again, if you think about it, opioids take care of the big chunk of it, but it's really not all opioids. It's fentanyl and a little bit of everything else, okay? 250 Americans per day die from fentanyl poisoning, okay? So that's across the U.S., 250 people per day. It works out to about one every nine seconds. So think about this presentation. We've been going for 40 minutes, nine. There's two. That's a lot of people. In California, if we just look at California, because you know we're a big state, we have to sometimes um, put it into perspective. 117 Californians a week die from fentanyl poisoning, okay? So in 2020, in 2022, Newport Beach was, uh, they did a little bit, uh, their information came out a little bit faster, so that's why it's Newport Beach specifically. Uh, 130 overdoses in Newport Beach alone. So if you think about just the community of Newport Beach had 130 overdoses. Now, statistics, for anybody who's in the room, Statistics are really, really useful, but what do you need in order for a statistic to be useful? Anybody know? Come on, you can drop it in the chat. I know there's some, some star students in here. Statistics need what? What does a statistic actually represent? Data, right? Population, good, fantastic. Thank you, a sample size. That's exactly right. So think about it, 130 overdoses confirmed in Newport Beach. But what does that mean? That means that it had to have been reported, that it was taken somewhere, that somebody was able to say this was an overdose and this is what happened, and that they were a population that people cared enough to make sure what was happening to them. Now, think about a lot of the various populations that if they pass away, they assume natural causes, the elements, right? Old age, one of the highest and most quickly growing populations of fentanyl poisoning uh, victims are over 65. And it is vastly underreported because if you were over 65 and you pass away in your sleep, people just assume, oh, it must have been a comorbidity. It must have been their age. But when the, um, when the autopsies are done, the rate of fentanyl poisoning is found to be higher than even the general population. And that is because where are they getting their prescription medications? They're not necessarily getting them from FDA approved pharmacies because they can't afford it. So if you're picking them up from a friend who went to Mexico or you order them offline from the Philippines or you get them from India and they come here, the number of hands that those have passed through with the prevalence of fentanyl means that, again, you are having an issue. The current statistics are that eight out of 10 pills that come into Orange County that are not from an FDA approved pharmacy are laced with some amount of fentanyl. Now that can be either because of what we call adulteration or cross-contamination. It's a real, it touched fentanyl. And so now it's covered in fentanyl. Or what happens most of the time is it's a fake pill. There is anywhere from, you know, 90 to 0% of what the pill is supposed to be still in that pill. And the rest of it is filled up with fentanyl. That's what we're seeing a lot. So eight out of 10 pills that don't come from an FDA pharmacy are 
laced with fentanyl. Of those, 60% have enough fentanyl in them to be potentially fatal. So this is affecting everyone, okay? Uh, oh, perfect, okay. Um, this one is, is really sad to me. And I, I do want to, unfortunately, I, I need to go back in and look at the numbers because I want to see for all of Orange County because I imagine it's much higher than this. But again, if you're thinking about reports, all the ways in which we do it, just in Newport alone, <clears throat> since January of this year, we have had 12 minors have what they consider an overdose of fentanyl in Newport. 12 since January. And this was last updated in July. Okay. Fentanyl is the number one killer of minors in Orange County. Okay. So under 18, the number one thing of all the things that could kill you in Orange County, the number one is fentanyl poisoning. Now, you might have noticed I when I talk about opioids, I often talk about overdose. But when I'm talking about fentanyl, I use the term poisoning. And there is a very specific reason for that. When you hear the term overdose, if I were face to face, we would I would make this more of a learning moment and we would talk together. But overdose for this say tends to mean you took too much of a product you intended to take, right? You got heroin, you got cocaine, you got Oxycontin, you took them and you took too much and you unfortunately passed away right or were reversed we call it a reversal of naloxone but it's because you took too much fentanyl poisoning when you hear the term poisoning um that should tell you something it does not matter necessarily the amount that you take if it's as little as three milligrams and most of the time, people do not intend to take fentanyl when they have a fentanyl poisoning. Of all of the fentanyl poisonings that are reported in the U.S., 78% of those intentional ingestion of fentanyl. So that means they got a pill that said it was one thing and ended up being something else, or they got a pill that was legitimate, but it had touched fentanyl. And that was an issue. It was in another drug, cocaine, MDMA, whatever. And they take it and they pass away because of something they never intended to take. And some people say, well, they were planning on taking drugs. You know, didn't they, quote, deserve it? We can get into the ethics of, of what a statement like that means later if we want to. But if we think about that really practically, one of the best examples I've ever seen of this is with drinking. Drinking, alcohol is a drug. It is just a drug that we have legalized. It is a substance that changes the way your body reacts to the world around it. Now, if you went to a bar and you ordered a drink and you ordered... Uh, Long Island iced tea, and it comes, and you drink it, and somebody had added another element to that drink, other than what you know to be in a Long Island iced tea, and you passed away because of that, who would you consider to be at blame for that death? Is it the person who ordered the drink and drank it, or is it the person who added the substance that was not consented to. When we talk about alcohol, people tend to know. They tend to say, well, obviously the person who put it in there, they didn't order, you know, rohypnol or ketamine or whatever. They ordered a drink. That's what they should have. Because of our stigmatization of drug seeking behavior, we often then say, well, it's all illegal, and so therefore we have an issue. But at the heart of it, at the basic level, it is a matter of consent. They asked for, and the transaction was for, whatever it was. And a lot of the times what we're seeing is people who take things like an Adderall or a Xanax or any number of low-level 
painkillers that they are using for sometimes recreation, sometimes self-medication, sometimes, again, you have a big test and your Adderall prescription ran out. It's not like these are people who are just like, woo, I want to take an Adderall. Like they have already been prescribed this medication for quite some time. So they start to blur the lines a little bit. Oh, well, mine ran out and I have this test. So let's take it. And they're dying from it. Again, letter of the law says that that was illicit because it was not prescribed to them, but they did not consent to what was in there. They did not say, give me a pill full of fentanyl. They said, give me whatever it is I ordered. And they died because it was something other than that. So this is why we say everyone can be affected by this. I have talked to lawyers. I have talked to politicians. I have talked to major heads of companies that once we go through the presentation, they go, well, but that doesn't count. Like, my neighbor gave me a few extra Percocet when I threw my back out. Like, that's fine, right? Do you know where that came from for sure? Do you know what happened? Most of the time when somebody has a cross-contamination issue <clears throat> in which fentanyl becomes introduced into the system, it's within two degrees of separation from the person who was poisoned. So you might trust the person who gave it to you. Do you trust the person who gave it to them? Do you trust all of the places that that traveled before it came here? When you only have to get two to three milligrams in order to be fatal, you start thinking, okay, what are we going to do? So we know one thing, which is naloxone. Can anybody quickly just really throw it in the trap? As magic as this is, can anybody think of the one major drawback that something like naloxone would have? I told you that people would be unresponsive. You would come in, you would check, you put it up the nose, you squeeze, and then they will come to. What about that scenario makes this sound like it has one major drawback? Well, I'm waiting for somebody to answer. Lucinda, um, I am trying to get that information and I, we will, if you go to our website, uh, fentanylsolution.org, we update um, county statistics um, as often as we can. And we also have uh, at least a couple articles per week that are talking about various issues with fentanyl. And I will make sure that um, that data is updated as soon as I have it. So if you want to just like, earmark that it's a it's a good place to go to there's a lot of information on there but we can definitely get the data per city for you um absolutely they become aggressive that's an issue we're going to go even further back from that in order to know that they got aggressive you had to be in the room with them right naloxone you can't give it to yourself because what is it it's after you have become unresponsive so this only works when there are a minimum of two people in the room and one of them has to be with it enough to be able to administer this, okay? So in Orange County, one of the things we find a lot, and it is devastating, and it is tragic, but it is why we have these conversations, is, again, we are a, a privileged and wealthy county. And what that often means is that our children get the privilege of having their own room. They get to have their own computer, their own smartphone. They have disposable income. So they order a pill online, often through, um, it can happen really on any social media, but the, the, the app du jour is Snapchat because the um, conversations disappear after 24 hours. They can order a pill from a dealer who has usually found them. There's emojis. There's a whole language that you can learn. They can have it delivered to the house by Uber Eats, Postmates, any delivery service. And they think that they're delivering just like they would deliver anything else. They think it's groceries. They think it's food. They have no idea. They just deliver the thing. Now, they have this pill in their house. And often we see it in sort of two times. Either that golden time for mischief between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. They're out of school but parents aren't home from work yet. That's one. And then sort of that like 11 to one, right? House is asleep. They are maybe doing some shenanigans on the computer. 
They order it. Nobody else is in the room with them. They take the pill. And this can enter your system and cause you to be non-responsive within five minutes. That fast. Hits you. You're out. No one's there. So they come the next morning to check on them because they didn't get up for school. Or sometimes parents, you know, I mean, parents have intuitions. They say, I, I felt like something was wrong. I got up to go to the bathroom. So I said, oh, I'll just check in on my kid. And they were gone. They were uh, often in the same position they were in when they took the pill because it happens that fast. Just slumped over, done, out. This wasn't going to help those kids because they're alone. So we have to think of another way. And that's where this is reaction. This is preparation for when you are with a group of people or more than one people. This is really what you need. Come on. Can I get it close? This is what you really need for if somebody is going to be consuming anything by themselves. These are what we call fentanyl test strips. Uh, you'll see them often as FTS. Uh, fentanyl test strips literally do what they say. They will test a drug to see if there is the presence of fentanyl in it, okay? Because what is that big percentage? Illicit fentanyl, that's what's killing people. So <coughs> we use this uh, brand in particular, it's called Wise Batch. And we use this one because of a couple of reasons. One, it's the only brand currently on the market that has individual instructions on every package. And it also has a QR code there, if you can see, it is a QR code that you can you can click on, and it gives you comprehensive instructions on how to test whether it's a powder, a pill, or a liquid. Those are your three main ways, right? The things going to come together, and it also provides for if you were to take something and it popped positive, there is a, a an anonymous reporting site where you can put in the zip code of where you got the in, where you got the thing from, and you can put it, which helps with a lot of things when we're trying to look for is in order to take care of the issue being able to come as a community and say hey we've been reporting this we know exactly how many people are having this this makes a huge difference now people will say and i completely get it my kid doesn't do it why do i need that this is going to encourage drug use well feelings are valid but they are not always correct right validity and correctness aren't always the same thing lots and lots and lots of studies have been done on things like naloxone and fentanyl test strips. And not a single study has shown that having access to either of these things increases drug use or increases risk-seeking behavior. Those two things do not increase. Does anybody, can anybody guess the one statistic that changes when you present people with these two products and have them available and easily to use? Does anybody have an idea? One stat changes when you introduce this into the scenario. Perfect. Patrice, A plus. Deaths. The only stat that changes. And it whoo, sinks. Okay? So, as part of a comprehensive drug education, we're still telling children, you should abstain. We live in a very dangerous time for drug use. You don't get to experiment the way that you're, and let's be really honest, if we can really be honest about it, how many of us, our parents, our grandparents, also experimented, but they grew out of it. Again, back to that first thing. This is not a drug you can grow out of because it kills you on one, two, three tries. Boom, you're done. So we don't want you to take it. We can talk about the, the uh, developmental biology of it. We can talk about the psychology of it, right? Your brain is still developing. Don't be putting these uh, chemicals in there. Um, you know, it's a dangerous thing. But people still make mistakes. They still decide to try something. And having these things available, whether your kid is someone who you know uses it or not, having them available for their friends, right? This could be the difference between their friend being alive the next day and not, right? 
This is the difference between somebody who is home alone being alive or not the next day. And for me, what I say to, to parents when they get a little bit, and understandably, they get a little bit like, Ugh, I, this, this sort of fights my fundamentals, is I have two scenarios for you. One, you come home from work, you go to the cupboard, first aid kit, where you keep your naloxone, your fentanyl test strips, your band-aids, your gauze, your whatever, and you see the two of these are gone. And you've got your two kids upstairs. You get to go have a very, very serious conversation with them about why these two test strips are gone and what they were used for, right? But they're still alive. Now, you decided, you know what? My kids are not that. I don't want any of that in my house. It encourages drug use. Now you come home, you go upstairs, and you have two kids dead in their rooms. And I know that sounds macabre, and I know that sounds hyperbolic, but we see it every day. We have parents of 10-year-olds who died, not from accidentally rolling on the floor or something, who ordered a pill. They had heard about it in some way. It can come in bright colors. It can, you know, people, um, kids talk. 10 years old from intentional purchasing to accidental death. So as grim as it seems, our philosophy is if they are old enough to die from it, they're old enough to learn about it, okay? And responsible, in-depth parental tactics can really go a long way to make sure that they know what's available to them and are making the best and healthiest choices for them. But you need to be able to have them alive long enough to be able to make those decisions and to be able to make those arguments, okay? So if I were to wrap this up, I think I'm running a little over time. Sorry, I haven't taught in a long time in this way and I'm loving it. But fentanyl is the number one killer of individuals in America. It's the number one killer of teens in Orange County. We're losing 117 Californians a week specifically to fentanyl, okay? And those numbers just keep climbing. Two things that can help make that not happen are access to naloxone, which is very, very easy to get in our county. They have done a very good job of making this available. And test strips, which are a little bit more difficult to get, but the county has promised that they are ordering and they will be part of the same distribution program as this um, sooner rather than later. The, the bid was supposed to go out mid-August. Um, so we'll see when those come through. But these two things can change a lot. Education, preparation, knowing where these things come from, and testing anything that you do not get directly from an FDA-approved pharmacy. So uh, some of the signs of ingestion of fentanyl are slowed and shallow breathing. So often it's uh, less uh, than one breath per six seconds, and it's, it's very little breath, right? Bluing of the fingers and around the mouth is another example. What's that also going to show, right? That there's not enough oxygen getting to the system. One of the telltale opiate signs is what we call pinpoint pupils. Teeny, teeny, tiny, like as if you out in the sun and your pupils basically disappeared. That's kind of what you're going to look at. Those are some of the main signs that we see. And if you remember those, if that's something that helps you, that's great. But in the moment, the biggest thing you want to see is, are they breathing? Are they responsive? And how are you going to check that? You're going to do that sternum rub, right? If they don't wake up to this, I don't care what their pupils look like, okay? I mean, bluntly, I'm. why does it matter, right? Here we go, boom, up the nose, call 911. The rest, somebody who went to school and got all that training, they can take care of the rest of that for me, okay? If that helps you, absolutely use it. But for me, if they're non-responsive, this is what I'm gonna start with, okay? 
rescue breathing, if um, this is not enough to bring them back, rescue breathing is always really fantastic. Uh, CPR, it depends on when your last training was, because a lot of times people don't actually know how to do it the right way. Rescue breathing, that's getting oxygen through the body. What it can also do is if you've used up all the naloxin you had and they're not coming to, sometimes the rescue breathing can get it circulating. If you are somebody who's comfortable, again, and feels you have the knowledge for CPR, that's a whole nother thing. Eventually, what I really hope is that this becomes a part of CPR first aid training because they will they will do a really good job of differentiating when that should happen. But if you're not trained for it, just pounding on their chest isn't going to necessarily help them out. In the same way that anything you've seen in a movie, kind of just avoid that to try to wake them up. Don't be throwing ice on them. Don't slap them. Don't knock them around. Those are not helpful things. Simple little sternum rub, you're good to go. All right. I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, if there are, I don't know how much time, if we have time, um, I'm happy to answer questions for as long as we have. But um, other than that, um, thank you so much. This, uh, this is great. And then if you want more information, this uh, fentanyl solution, this QR code, it will take you to our website. I believe, you know, full disclosure, I believe because of the last time I did this, this takes you directly to the donation page. I'm not trying to do a tricky thing here. It will take you to the site and you can look at all the other information. You know, you don't have, it's not like you have to pay and it's not a paywall. That's just where that QR code will take you. And then you can go from there. Okay. On that website again, if you have a group, like I said, a uh, book club, church group, uh, to, I've had teachers associations where they, they feel that the school isn't moving quite quickly enough, uh, getting enough naloxin. Um, I don't care who it is. I don't ask a lot of questions. If you have a group of people that want to know more about this and want to have these things, sign up for our lunch and learn. And as many people as you have, we will give you what we call, we call this our stop fentanyl pack. It comes with this nice bright red thing with a little carabiner. And you can have this with you. A couple of last things in case you buy naloxin. Uh, if you're using it for private use, this is private use. We're not talking about, you know, in the office. This is you as a private citizen, just because we want to make that clear. They have done studies that have shown naloxin was found after 20 years in a non-temperature uh, controlled environment. They tested it. It was still 96% effective. They also did a study in Arizona where for 31 days... They, 12 hours, they took it, they literally froze it solid. They brought it back to room temperature. They left it there for 12 hours. Then they took it up to 120 degrees for 12 hours. And they continued that cycle for 31 days. They tested the efficacy of it. 96% was the lowest efficacy. So put these in your car, throw them in your glove box, have them in the bottom of your purse. If you find someone who needs it, 96% is a huge percentage. That is a huge amount, right? I, as you heard at the beginning, I lost my dad and my brother. Unfortunately, nobody was there with them when that happened. If somebody and I don't care if this 50% effective. I would want to, I would have wanted them to try. 96%? That's insane, right? So that's something to know as well. People are worried, like, oh, what if it expires? They have found that it doesn't really have an expiration date. Those are still important. Again, if you're buying them for an office, if you're wanting to protocol. That's a different conversation, and our training can work on that. But as a private citizen, I find one on the ground, dust it off, stick it up my nose if I'm out. I don't care. Okay? Uh, uh, great. Uh, not seeing. Uh, let's see. Some emojis are society expressions associated with buying or using fentanyl. So they change quite a bit. You know, I'm an old guy now. Um, so what I can do is when I send this PowerPoint, I will send over there some really great, um, if you look at, there is a foundation, uh, I'll put it in the chat. Uh, the Alexander Neville Foundation, uh, Amy Neville uh, is the president and CEO of Alexander Neville Foundation. And she specifically, her son Alex died of fentanyl poisoning here in Laguna Niguel. Um, he'd been using for 10 days. From the day he first got his first pill to the day that he died, 10 days. But she has really fantastic information specifically about the connection of Snapchat with drug trade. And she has a lot of parent resources and school resources. So I would um, I would take a look at that and see. I think she even has a downloadable version of it. But I'll find it after this and I'll send it over as well. Um, 
So yeah, I, I wouldn't want to begin to, I know some of the old ones, you know, I know what some of them, but I wouldn't want to begin to guess at that right now, because at the end of the day, uh, they change that. And sometimes it doesn't matter. They could put an orca and a, you know, and a pine tree. And if that gets you to go over to another app to talk about it, they did their job, right? It's really about getting signals to say, Hey, I got something you might want. Let's go talk about it. Okay. Well, awesome. If uh, if it's okay with Edward, uh, you're the you're the um, authority. So um, when you send out, when I send this over to you and, and you send it out, um, feel free to send my email as well. So if anybody has any other questions, they want to reach out, um, they want to ask anything or they have any other clarifications, I'm happy to do that as well. But I really appreciate everybody uh, taking the time. Um, it's a lot of information to throw in at, at this oh, time, yeah. but I think everybody did a great job. So thank you so, so much. And um, obviously, uh, you know, Edward, you know this so, so much, but this is a, again, a multi-pronged approach. What we really do, we kind of consider it the triage of the work, trying to keep people alive so that we can get them to places for treating their mental health, for getting them the resources that they need, for getting them community involvement. But you have to keep them alive in order to be able to do that. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you so much, Absolutely. Shane, for your presentation. We really appreciate it. It's Absolutely. very important. Uh, if you want more information on NAMI OC, you can go to our website at namioc.org. And again, uh, we really appreciate you, Shane, for coming. And uh, we hope to have uh, another representative or you come back again to talk about what, what's going on maybe next year. Absolutely. Anytime you want. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks All right. a lot, Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.